All right, welcome everyone. Uh, this will be the live Q&A for module four. Uh, like we've done in the past, we'll start by going through the quiz questions from the prior module um, and then see if anybody has any uh, questions related to that. And then we'll step through the uh, module, uh, module four homework and go from there. So let's start with the module three quiz. So question one, we're given eight spillway gates, each with a 0 0.075 probability of not opening. We're asked, what is the probability of exactly four gates not opening? So the correct answer for this one is gonna be 1.62 times 10 to the minus three. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to use the uh, binome dist function in Excel. So when we do that, our first input is gonna be for uh, the number of gates that do not open, which is four in this case. The second input is gonna be the total number of gates, which will be eight. And um, the third input is gonna be the uh, probability of the gate not opening, so 0.075. And then the last input is going to be false because we want the um, exactly four gates, not four or uh, up to four. So correct answer is the third one there. It's 1.62 times 10 to the minus three. Question number two, true or false, when calculating the incremental consequences associated with gate inoperability, the reduced or throttled spillway discharges should be used when estimating the non-breach consequences. That one is gonna be false. We, we wanna use the, uh, the spillway discharges associated with intended operation. Remember, non-breach is always associated with 100% reliability as intended operation. If you were to use the reduced or throttled discharge and you would be artificially uh, increasing your incremental risk. So always want to use the as intended releases when making those calculations. Question number three, we're given a fault tree and we're asked what is the probability the gate fails to operate? So here we've got probabilities for emergency power backup failing, commercial power backup failing, and then um, failing of the gate operation controls and gate mechanical drive. So to do this one, we need to know what these different um, gates in the fault tree stand for. So this first one here is an AND gate. So to get the probability associated with that, we would take the probability of the two events and multiply them together. So 0.04 times 0.02, and then for these other two are gonna be OR gates. So to do OR gates, we, we need the uh, probability of union. So we can use De Morgan's rule to get that. So we will take one minus the product of one minus 0 0.05 times one minus 0 0.01. And then we will take these two numbers, this uh, 0.0008 and 0.0595, and we will use De Morgan's rule to combine those together. So the correct answer is gonna be 0.0603, which is 6.03 times 10 to the minus two. Okay. Question four, uh, when gate inoperability is a concern, the incremental risk should be evaluated with and without gate inoperability to illustrate the impact of gate inoperability on the total incremental risk that is gonna be true. So this is one of those things where gate inoperability by itself is not necessarily a failure mode. But what it does is it increases the peak stage um, and increases the frequency of the peak stage, which therefore impacts all other failure modes. So that increase in all the other failure modes is really the fault of gate inoperability. So the best way to do that is to run everything um, Considering gated operability, run everything without, and then you can subtract those results to then get the impact that is associated just with 
uh, gate and operability. We do the same thing with debris blocks as well. And then question number five, the annual exceedance probabilities from the stage frequency curve are used in the joint loading calculations for a seismic failure mode. That is going to be false. We use the duration exceedance probabilities. We need the percentage of time that a stage is present during the year to then see, you know, how likely it is that when the earthquake occurs, is the stage or is the pool going to be at a given stage? Okay. Any questions on um, the quiz or any of the solutions that I just went through? not, let's move into uh, the Module 4 homework. All right, so I've got the Module 4 homework queued up and I've got, if we've got two different sets of files here. We've got one for um, those of you who were able to get a copy of At Risk, that's the one that's on the left. And then the one on the right is going to be for those who did not get a copy of that risk. We're just kind of typing in formulas to see how this thing works. So I'm going to go through kind of both side by side. You can kind of see how things were working. Um, for the most part, it seemed like um, people did pretty well. Um, it seemed like the biggest people had was how to actually call the data to make the scatter plot. But we'll get to that in just a minute. All right. So. First things first, at least for the people who have at risk, we need to execute the program. So I'll go ahead and click that, I'll give it to a minute to initialize and load. All right, so that should be up and running. So for this homework, we're asked to generate the FN scattered plot given the data that we have. We're told to use a triangular distribution for node three. So this first node here, river stage exceeds the top of levee elevation. Basically, that's just defining our zero point. We know that um, top of levee for this one is going to be 1025. So we're going to have a probability of zero for an overtopping failure mode until it gets above 1025. So you see the zeros that were carried forward in node two and three. So we will actually have a zero for the system response there for 1025. So above, we've got the um, deterministic probabilities given for node two, and then we have a um, have the inputs for a triangular distribution that we're going to set up for node three. So to set up the triangular distribution, that function is going to be risk triang. And then the first input is going to be the lowest reasonable value. The second input is going to be your most likely value. And then the third and final input is going to be your highest reasonable value. So depending on how you have your settings, if you've got them set to where it pulls, uh, where a uh, at-risk function will, will give you the, the mean, you should get 0.128 for that result standing in for that distribution. So we'll repeat the same thing for these other two. You can type it in, or since everything's set up the same, we can just drag that over. So again, risk triang, lowest reasonable, most likely, and then highest reasonable. So doing the same thing over here, little different in that we actually have to type it out all three times, which is kind of annoying, but C18, then C19, and then C20. Oops, those all should be Ds, my fault. Now we got a winner. If I hit enter there and have that formula correct, it should give me the mean value that we saw earlier. Okay, so I'll do the same thing over here, but now instead of B, all these cells will start with E, so E18, P19, yikes, E19, and E20. And then the last. 
last one would be F. Something like that. Okay. So the next thing to make sure that we are um, the relationship with stage is maintained, we want to use consistent percentile sampling. And to do that, we need to set up a correlation matrix um, to correlate these three distributions um, for a given iteration, and we want them to be perfectly correlated. So to do that, we're going to highlight these three cells, and then we're going to go up here where it says correlation, and we're going to define a correlation matrix. So it's going to ask me to, um, my inputs are already here, so I'm specifying that those inputs are going to be from D21 to F21, which is correct, so I can click OK. And then I've got a choice. It gives me this matrix here. I can update it here and then put it into the spreadsheet, or I can update it within the spreadsheet. I usually don't mess with this dialog box. I usually do it within the spreadsheet itself. So I'm going to click OK, and then it's going to ask me to select the first cell, the Excel range where that matrix is going to be written. When we do this, we always want to make sure that we have enough room for that, um, for that matrices. Um, this table set up for you. So we'll click B26, click OK, and it'll pull the table in. Now, I have the table in, but I'm not done. So because these are zeros, there's no correlation going on right now, even though I've added the correlation matrix. So for perfect correlation, I'm going to need to add ones into each of these zeros. So basically what's going on is it's you can look at the column in the row to see which two cells we're talking about. But we want um, D, the distribution in column D, to be correlated with the distribution in column E, and we want it to be um, correlated with the distribution in column F. So both of these will be ones. And we also want um, the distribution in E to be correlated with the distribution in F. So this will also be a one. So I noticed that um, some people during, um, when they did their homework, just left those as zeros. We need to replace those as one to make sure that um, our distributions are correlated. And that's perfect correlation. Um, so in the non-at-risk version, you didn't really have the option to add the matrix, so I already had the matrices added, but we just need to edit that by adding the ones in. Okay? So what ends up happening is when I put that in, you'll notice that, at least in the at-risk version, it's adding um, an argument to our formula. So it's referencing the correlation matrix, and then it's referencing uh, the the position within the table there. All right, so now that I have that, the next step is to get my system response probabilities. The system response probabilities are always going to be the product of all of the uh, nodal estimates across a given stage. So we know that outside of elevation 1025, all of the um, probabilities for the river stages exceeding top of levee is going to be one. So we really don't have anything to add there. So our system response is going to be simply the product between the node two probability and the node three probability. So I will take the node two probability for the stage and multiply it by the node three probability for that stage. Once I have that, Everything set up the same so I can drag those over. Again, it's just node 2 times node 3. And we'll do the same thing over here. In fact, I'll go ahead. I just typed in 0 on the at-risk version, but we could have done it just like this as well. Okay. Any questions on that 
first part before I move on to the stage frequency stuff? Pretty simple and straightforward. All right. So next, I've got um, data for my stage frequency relationships. Um, I've got the fifth percentile, the 50th percentile, and the 95th percentile annual exceedance probabilities. So what I'm going to need to do from here, because um, annual exceedance probabilities often span of, you know, sometimes can span several orders of magnitude, um, it's easier to set up um, find a distribution that works if we're using the non-exceedant z-variate. The reason we're using z-variate is because it's plotted on a probability scale, so we're able to kind of turn those probabilities into numbers that are much closer together. So you can kind of see how for elevation 1025, we're spanning two orders of magnitude, whereas here, you know, we're spanning a digit, so it makes it easier to fit a distribution to it. Um, so we are told, uh, we aren't told, yes we are, we're told to use a, um, an alt-pert distribution. So what the alt-pert distribution is going to do is it is going to make sure that um, our fifth percentile or whatever percentiles we set, fifth, fiftieth, and ninety-fifth, that we hit exactly those probabilities. So it'll back its way into a PERT distribution that has a fifth percentile with these, these values, a 50th with these values, and a 95th with these, okay? So starting on the at-risk side, the function is gonna be at risk, or risk PERT fault. The first input is going to be um, the um, probability or the uh, percentile, and then we can take the um, corresponding z value, and then we want the second percentile and its corresponding z value, and then the third percentile and its corresponding z value. I should get a number that looks something like that. One thing that is different about um, the alt-pert distribution, that is the, um, you have to actually run it to actually get the mean. So this number really doesn't mean a whole lot until we get through and, and run things. So once I have that set up, I can drag that all the way down. Oops, maybe not. I didn't put dollar signs in there. So I need the, um, I want to lock the um, percentile probabilities. So that's going to be those right there. Now I should be able to drag those down and we're set. Okay. So doing it over here on the non-risk, non-at-risk side, basically we're just typing everything in. So risk hurt alt. And then I need um, be C51, C52, D51, D52, E51, E52. If I punch that in correctly, I will get a probability down here in this next table. You'll note, again, these probabilities don't match. They will match after I run the simulation in the at-risk version. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay? So then the next one, this time I want C51 and C53, same thing in the next column, so on and so forth, I get the next value, one more. And now we're going to use stuff in row 54. All right, so on the at-risk side, I need to correlate 
these distributions together. Again, we need to be able to, when we sample, we want to keep the shape of the stage frequency relationship. And the way to do that is uh, consistent percentile sampling. And the best way to replicate that is to correlate the distributions. So I will highlight those three cells. We'll go up to correlation like we did before, and we'll click define correlation matrix. Think for a minute. Click OK. And then this time I'm going to go ahead and um, update it here so you can see how it works. But once I change those, it changes the ones on the outside. And then I click OK. It's going to ask me where to put it. I want to put it in cell B57. I click OK. And I have my correlation matrix all ready to go, all loaded up with ones. So on the not at risk side, we'll change those zeros to one. Really doesn't do anything in this particular spreadsheet, but important step when we do have at risk for our simulation. All right. Quest questions on that before moving into um, the life loss distributions? And I'll come back after I run it to prove that these values changed to be equal to those. It has to be the mean of those values, but all right. All right, so moving on to our uh, breach and non-breach life loss, we're told to use PERT distributions for each of these. So the formula is going to be risk PERT, and we're given Lowest reasonable, most likely, and highest reasonable. So first input your lowest reasonable, second your most likely, and your third is your highest reasonable. And I will get the mean of the PERT distribution. So the mean is going to be equal to the lowest reasonable plus four times the most likely plus the highest reasonable value all divided by six. So you're kind of waiting that uh, most likely value four times more than your low and your high. So once I have that in, I can drag those across. Um, I can also copy and paste that down because everything's set the same way. So again, it's risk part, and then I'm going to have my lowest, my most likely, and my highest values as the inputs. So we'll do the same thing here on the no at risk side. Just pert. One, two, three. So most likely high. And one more time for the non breach. values that I got in the other spreadsheet. All right, so now I need to, I want to correlate the breach and non-breach life loss. So I am going to highlight this top row and then I'm going to hold control and highlight this row as well. So now I'm going to have a much bigger correlation matrix because I've got six different distributions that uh, I'm correlating together. I'll come up here and define the correlation matrix. Okay. And then I'm going to add this one in without updating it. So I'm going to click OK. We're going to go into cell B96. And that'll populate like that. So when you start getting bigger um, correlation matrices, it can kind of be a hassle to go through and change all the numbers by hand. If you are um, going for perfect correlation across the board, the easiest thing to do is just to highlight all of those and then replace zeros, oops, 
We're going to find one and replace that with. We're going to find zero and replace it with one, and then click replace all, and it does it really quick for you. We can actually do the same thing over here. Questions on that? So once we have that set up, we have everything we need. We've got our system response, we've got our stage frequency, we've got our life loss, so all three pieces of the risk equation. We're ready to go through and do these risk calculations just like we uh, have done in the prior modules. So we'll start by getting our midpoint stage, the stage partitions were given to us this time. Um, midpoint stage is just going to be the average of the stages. I can drag those down. Do the same, I should be able to just copy and paste and do the same thing over here. So then my loading probability I'm going to need to uh, interpolate. So we're going to find the AEP of the um, first first stage that defines the range, and then subtract from that the AEP of the second stage of the partition. So we'll use Lindsay int. Um, we actually don't have a value for uh, uh, 1005. We're told to assume an AEP of one for that one. So we can start by taking one minus and then go interpolate to get the AEP of that second stage, 1025. So that'll be my X value, my um, set of X values will be here, and my Y value will be the AEP. Just like we've done in the past. Okay, I should get a 1.0 for that one. So then next, I need to do the same thing, but for both of them. So I've got in the int x value, x array, y array, comma one, comma zero. One is for the order, zero is for the whether or not we want to extrapolate. And then I'm gonna go ahead and copy this guy and move him over, but I want it to reference uh, C112, the, the other stage of the partition. I'll get that probability. I should be able to drag that down except for the very last one. And we should be set. So if I did that right, everything should sum to exactly one. This first one's actually a little bit less than one, but you have to really get the decimals out there to be able to tell that. So then from here, I need the uh, breach life loss. So I'm going to use linear interpolation to find that using the midpoint stage of the partition. The breach life loss comes from this table right here. So my X values will actually be that row. And then the Y values will be that row. So that first one there should be 2.3. I should be able to, if I lock those rows and columns correctly, I should be able to just drag that down, not that far, and get the rest of the table there. Okay. We'll repeat that process for the non breach life loss, which will reference these cells here. So get that. And then, of course, the incremental life loss is going to be the breach life loss minus the non breach life loss. So then for my system response, I'm going to 
interpolate. We're dealing with an overtopping failure mode. So we're going to want to use um, linear interpolation. So I got lin int and find my midpoint stage. And then I need to scroll all the way up to the top to find my system response relationship. So these will be the X values. These will be the Y values. Should get a zero for the first one, but then probabilities for the, the next set. So then our annual probability of failure, that's going to be equal to our loading probability times our system response. Write that down. And then our average annual life loss is going to be the incremental life loss we weren't given day and night. So there is no exposure weighting going on in this one. We'll just take the APF times the incremental life loss. That should be set there. Okay. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to try to do it pretty quickly over here on the uh, non-at-risk version, see, but basically following the same procedure. The cheat needs some shortcuts to make this go a little quicker. Almost. Not that much quicker when you don't click the right thing. Here we go. Hopefully those numbers look familiar. The numbers that won't be the same are the loading probability, like we talked about, and APS times. So again, if you're using the non-at-risk version, you should get slightly different values, but it should look something like that. Any questions on getting that table? So it was the next couple steps that I think tripped up a couple people. I want to make sure that we go through this kind of slowly to make sure we understand what's going on. So to get the annual probability of failure for PFM1, I need to sum up these annual probability of failures from the table above. Now. I need to mark it as an output. So when we mark something as an output in at risk, we are telling it to store its result every iteration that's run. If you don't, it won't store that data and you won't be able to call it. And we want to make our scatter plot, we need the result for every iteration. So the best, simplest way to do that is to type in risk output open and close parentheses. You can put stuff in the parentheses to name it, 
which might make it easier when you go back and you know explore your data through some of the other features that risk has um, i'm usually lazy i usually just type it in risk output like you see there and then plus whatever um, the formula needs to be for what you're evaluating so in our case that is going to be the sum of these probabilities right here so it'll return the sum but again putting that risk output in front will um, force at risk to store every value for every iteration of the simulation okay so we'll do the same thing for um, the average annual life loss risk output I want the sum of the values in column K. And then for N, N is going to be the average annual life loss divided by your APF. But I still want the output on that one. So average annual life loss divided by the annual probability of failure. Should get eight. Now that I've defined those as outputs, the single point, our, our best estimate or our expected value for the risk for PFM1 will come from the mean of that output. So the at-risk function for this one is gonna be risk mean and I want the mean of that cell for the APF. The cell for the average annual life loss. And then I need to be really careful here. The mean of this output function is not going to be the mean end bar. The mean end bar is going to, there's an order of operations issue that would happen if I tried to do that. So I'm always going to take the average annual life loss and divide it by the APF. Those two means to then get the mean result. Now, you'll notice that right now these are exactly the same. That's because we haven't run anything yet. When we do, this value will be different than this value. Okay, so in fact, let's go ahead and do that now, and then we'll, I don't know if it'll let me. Um, I might be able to keep working on the no at risk size side, but I doubt it. Now let's go ahead and click simulate here and let it do its thing. So one thing I didn't cover or didn't show you is that for those of you um, in, you know, work for the Corps of Engineers with the government, um, we have to do it only with one CPU. So we need to disable multiple CPUs. Uh, reason being what at risk will do is it'll try to open a new instance of Excel. And every time it does that, um, the macros that we're using to interpolate and do things like that, they won't pull in because um, our security settings won't allow us to automatically enable macros. So that's why we can't use multiple CPUs. It's kind of a bummer because we get start getting into bigger and bigger spreadsheets. It really increases your runtime, and those extra CPUs would have been nice to kind of speed things up. So if you don't have that limitation, by all means, enable multiple CPUs, but otherwise it's not something that at least us government employees can do. Um, the other thing, there's a smart sensitivity analysis. Let me go ahead and open those up and show you where, where you can find those. This is where the multiple CPU simulations is disabled. And then uh, this is where you'd want to uh, disable smart sensitivity analysis. Um, for our purposes, that smart sensitivity analysis isn't really all that helpful and it just makes the simulation take longer so it's best to have that disabled don't have to you still get 
same result, but it'll just take longer to run. All right, so going over to the um, non-at-risk side, let's go ahead and punch in what we had done before. So again, we got our risk output, and then we're gonna plus the sum of my APS values. Second one is going to be for the sum of the average annual life loss values. And the third one is going to be the average annual life loss divided by the APS. And as before, it's going to be risk mean of our APS output, this mean of our average annual life loss output, but then this last one is going to be the mean average annual life loss divided by the mean annual probability of failure. Okay. So the spot where a number of you all had trouble was calling uh, the risk data. So that formula is going to be risk data and doing plus sign. There we go. Risk data. Yikes. Sorry, being really clumsy. Risk data. Now I need I'm gonna have three different inputs into this formula. The first one is gonna be the output that I want to call the data from. So I'm in the APS column, so I need the APS output cell. So that's going to be C122. And that's going to be the same for every iteration, so I'm going to want to lock rows and columns. I don't want that to move on me. Okay. The second input is going to be the iteration number. And with the way things are set up, I've got all the iteration numbers here in column B, so I can just reference that. The third input is going to be our simulation number. The vast majority of the time, unless you've got it set up to do multiple simulations, we're always going to be calling simulation number one. So we'll put in a one there and then hit enter. I should get the iteration result for uh, the very first iteration. The number that shows up on my screen is going to be different than the number that shows up on your screen because every simulation is going to be different. Um, but I can take that value and drag that down and it'll populate the rest of that column. I've got the mean down at the bottom reproduced. That's just for plotting purposes. It's just calling these numbers right here. All right, so I'm going to do the same thing for the average annual life loss, so that is going to be, again, risk data. I need the average annual life loss output cell, that's going to be C123, the iteration number, and then the simulation number. I can drag that all the way down. So then when I get to uh, end bar, I've got a choice. I have the output data and I can call it and call the iteration results, or I can just take the average annual life loss and divide it by the APF. I should get the exact same thing. Um, in fact, let's prove it. So I will take the average annual life loss and divide that by the APF and I get eight. Go ahead and um, extend the decimal points to prove it. Or I can do this. I can do what we did prior. I can go risk data, call the end value for the first and the first simulation, and I get the same thing. So either way you do it is fine, at least in the uh, at-risk version. We'll drag that down 
and we should get an FN scatter plot that looks something like that. Spanning a couple orders of magnitude, main reason for that is the um, uncertainty in the stage frequency curve. If you remember, that spanned more than a couple order of magnitude, and that's what we're seeing here. So then on the uh, non-at-risk side, this one we got to be a little more specific with what the spreadsheet is asking for, so we're going to need to call the data for and bar. I can't just divide, even though I could over here. But anyway, starting with this first one, risk data. I need my output, the iteration, and then the simulation number. And then it should give me the results that I had preloaded in. Do the same thing over here for the average annual life loss. those numbers and one last time and I should be said if I did everything right there we should get something that looks very very similar which we do now again the iterations are all going to be slightly different but when you end up running 10,000 iterations, you should get a very similar looking um, scatter plot and your mean should come out to be nearly or about the same. I think uh, the prior time I ran this, I got like 9.52 times 10 to the minus four, essentially the same thing. Okay. So any questions on homework four? All makes sense now that you've seen it done really the biggest thing is just getting familiar with uh, those at-risk functions and knowing which ones to use and when and what the inputs are but you know once you've got that everything else just tracks the um, the exact same way as we've done things um, in the past just instead of using static values we're defining distributions for our inputs so when we get into um, module five, we'll, uh, we're going to go through a demonstration of RMC QRA calcs, and that's going to be a suite of spreadsheets that is set up to do, you know, your traditional standard uh, set of risk calculations. So a lot of all the calculations, all the things that we've been doing up to this point, are pretty much going to be preloaded into the set of spreadsheets. We're just going to have to um, type in our inputs, select some distributions, do some copy and pasting, and go from there. Let's see. Are all the modules signed? Yes, they should be, at least for that one. I've been um, talking to Tim O'Leary and some of the ACIP people about what to do, and, you know, there used to be a um, a patch or a file or something that you could download that, you know, where you could have access to um, macros, whether they were signed or not. But I, for whatever reason, that has been deleted from the app portal. So we're still working through that issue on all our uh, newer toolboxes that have been posted. Uh, the old ones still should have uh, the, signed, the signed macros in there. Any questions on anything else that was covered in the module or any other piece? Damon, could you kind yeah. of give another summary as far as why you picked the different correlation items to be correlated within the homework? 
sure. Um, so if you pull up the um, module four presentation to help us walk through that, if I can find it quickly. So again, first thing, so when we have our um, system response relationship, you'll see how we've got our, you know, the lowest reasonable there in the bottom, most likely in the middle, and then the highest reasonable at the top. And you can see how, as one would expect, those probabilities increase with an increasing stage, right? If I don't correlate them, that that shape, that um, the fact that they're monotonically increasing won't be preserved. So I could, let's say at you know, elevation 750, I sample high, but at elevation 760, I sample low, I can get a curve that's bouncing back and forth and that's um, not um, representative of reality and what you would expect and how it would perform. So when we correlate that, what we're doing is we're uh, basically doing consistent percentile sampling and we're maintaining that shape. So that's why it's important, at least for the stage uh, or for the system response relationship to correlate those together to maintain that shape and to keep a shape that's reasonable and that would match reality. So we, we do the same thing, again, on the consequence side. We don't want that curve bouncing around. Uh, we do the same thing on the stage frequency side. We don't want that curve bouncing, down, you know, bouncing around either. Um, with regard to um, breach and non-breach life loss, most of the time we will correlate to that together. Um, reason being, a lot of times those life loss estimates for both breach and non-breach are going to be driven by the same thing, like mobilization rate. So stands to reason that if I'm going to have a high mobilization um, for a non-breach scenario, that uh, you know, if I heed the non-breach warning, I would probably also heed the breach warning and mobilize. So we would correlate those two together. If you know, looking at our results, we see that, you know, the key factor is something like warning issuance, then we wouldn't want to correlate those together. So it all kind of depends, but a lot of the time, mobilization rate is going to be the key driver, so we'll correlate those together. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you. Very good. So question in the chat says, correlation matrix is not quite sensible to me. It's actually just a control matrix for uh, hypercube sampling. A real matrix uses uh, R squared. Yeah, so that, that matrix is the R squared. So if they're, we're using an R squared of one. So if there's no correlation, then the R squared would be zero. If they're um, perfectly uncorrelated, they'll be negative one. Does that make sense? Video shows lines projecting left to right. Not sure what you mean by left to right. Can you please elaborate on that question? Wouldn't it be more credible to use 0.7? Um, why?
Are you talking about using 0.7 all the time, some of the time? Turn left to right as they are drawn. Talking about in this one? When these things bounce around? Well, again, we're going for perfect correlation. So the best way to replicate, again, um, consistent percentile sampling, we would, we would want to use a one there, else you'll get some deviation. I mean, you can make a case for whatever correlation you want to use if, if you've got a good reason to. Um, again, we, we keep it simple and typically use a one. Any other questions? So one thing I did say that I would do that I didn't do was show how um, these results are in fact the same. So this is if I were to find the risk mean of this value here, but I don't have an output on it, that's why it's not returning the right thing. I'm gonna have to rerun it, but if I do that, should be the same thing that we see over in the non at risk version. Before running that, I'm going to go ahead and delete at least most of these so that at risk doesn't have to think and look through all of that. Oh, no worries, Michael, you're good. All right, let's get this run and then I should get a mean value that lines up with these. Pretty daggone close. Which I do. Um, Cool. All right. If if nobody has any other questions, I'll go through and was I have not talked about what the buzzword is. And to be honest with you, I forgot what I want the buzzword to be. So give me a second. Let me look it up. Um, The buzz, buzzword um, for this one is going to be correlation. The module four buzzword is correlation. And then as for um, the quiz, just like we've been doing, um, we'll go to Socrative. We'll go through the uh, the student login, and then the room number for this one is going to be R4 for module four, just like we've been doing. Okay. Um, for module five, like I said, you are going to need um, RMC QA calcs. I would go ahead and download a fresh copy of that. To get there, you can go through RMC toolboxes and go to RMC QA calcs right there. And then when you download it, what you will get is a zip file that has you know, a suite of spreadsheets, and then it will also have um, what I'm calling a quick start guide. 
that will help walk you through it. So within Module 5, I'll go, I basically walk through the quick start guide, which tells you kind of how to, how to use it. Um, and then I actually start by going through the first part of Homework 5. So in Homework 5, you've got a handful of potential failure modes that we're going to use these spreadsheets for. Um, for each failure mode, you're going to have to populate the risk spreadsheet. And then once you do that, we're going to pull data from those spreadsheets into the project risk spreadsheet. So I go through start to finish on how to do um, how to use these spreadsheets for the very first potential failure mode. And then it'll be your job to go through and do the same thing for failure mode two, and then failure mode three. And then in the end, what I'm asking for is the FN scattered plot. Now, if you have at risk, you'll run at risk to get that. If you don't, I'll show you each, each of these spreadsheets has a deterministic option that you can use and a screenshot of the deterministic FN plot will be good enough. So once I get my spreadsheet, it'll be all the way down here, too far. Down here at the bottom, where you'll have the choice between deterministic and probabilistic. Okay. So there was a question in the chat. Oh, did you get your question answered already? Let's see. Yeah. So yeah, the, the room number for that one is going for the module four quiz is going to be DLS 105R4. And again, the buzzword is going to be correlation. Okay. Mike, Michael also has his hand raised. Did you get your question answered? Okay. Yes, he got his question answered. Okay. All right. Well, if nobody has anything else, we'll. Um, We'll cut out a little early today. Um, all the Module 5 stuff should be uploaded and uh, ready to go. And I guess we'll see you next time for uh, office hours will be the next time we could get together. And then uh, the next live Q&A past the halfway point. So thank you guys for sticking with it. Thanks, Damon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.